So what happens is we create sort of the results from that, right? And we put those up on a planning board. Uh, in our case, we actually do it sometimes on a whiteboard and sometimes, oftentimes we do it electronically now. And we'll show you that a little bit later. Um, but we have all the planning meeting results from there. And then every two weeks we have this 90 minute sort of look back. You know, we figure out, you know, what ob obstacles did we have to go through? And we think of ways that we can, uh, you know, improve the team or the workplace. And we find out, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, and where we had problems and where we need to be better and, and things like that, right? And so what's, um, we also have an opportunity for you to raise any issues at that time. And what we do is we, we collect all that information on a whiteboard. And on the left-hand side, we put the good stuff, and on the right-hand side, we put the stuff that needs improvement. And everybody in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the meeting gets five votes. And from there, you can vote on which topics you want to discuss. And then from that, we take the three or four most popular items, and we discuss those. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. But this gives us an opportunity to form action items around those and assign those action items to certain teams. So it's an opportunity for us to understand what's going well, what's not working, how we can get better, and you know who's going to take the next steps. And so what happens is you get a planning board like this. You have the happy factor, and you have the needs improvement. And from here, you can see everybody gets the vote, and we take the most popular voted ones, and we start specifically dealing with those issues. But it's a, it's a way of sort of, in the first place, collecting all the problems, and then prioritizing those problems, and then dealing specifically and shrinking that, and dealing specifically with those certain problems. Any other meetings? Forget them. Forget them. You don't need them. You only need to have meetings when they're needed, right? And you only need to have meetings with relevant people, and you always want to make sure you only have a clear agenda whenever you have a meeting. Any other meeting you have outside of that, you don't even need to worry about. That's, and quite frankly, if you have a meeting, every day, once a week, and every two weeks. That's a lot of meetings in itself. So you really get to discuss a lot of options. The great thing about all those meetings is there's a structure to it. It's not a, it's a, it's a process. It's not um, a tightly bound structure, but it's a process that people understand and can embrace. And so I think I still have time probably. So I'll talk a little bit about, I probably have a lot of time. All right, so uh, let me talk a little bit about extreme programming and uh, again, I'd love to make a caveat, I am not a developer, all right? So, you have, a, you know, development processes in theory are, are different from the way, or independent from the way that you code. They're not overlapping. And in practice, many shops, they use agile processes and at least some extreme programming fundamentals. And what we actually do is we lay Scrum and XP on top of each other. And so, let me give you kind of the few core practices. So, lots of small releases in XP, right? You want to make sure that you have the requirements, the tools, the people, the customers. You want to make sure that you don't create this grand two-year plan and you're just delivering specs. You want to create always this working software. And it's important that you get feedback, and that's the key here, is that you're constantly engaged with the customer. Because the customer gets to try something out, they can see if they like it, if they can use it, if they like it, they keep going forward. If not, they say, yeah, you know what? This feature doesn't mean as much to me anymore as it used to. And it helps you guide which way you're going to direct your, your employees as well. The beautiful thing about this is our developers are generally very happy because they know they're delivering software that people are going to use. They're not creating some type of code base that no one's going to use. And they're very happy about this. And then you can release your cycles and you can do bug fixes every, uh, you know, after that. But what we do is the, like I mentioned earlier, the 98 day release cycle. So we release the, the, the key releases, or the major releases, every 98 days. And then following those 98 days, uh, in the following you know, days afterwards, we start working on all the bugs because we're getting lots of feedback. And what Atlassian does is we have something called JEC, which means jira.atlassian.com. And it's a way of tracking issues, right? And so what people do is they'll often put in, oh, I found this bug, or gee, it would be really cool if we could get this feature. And then we kind of use something called one-third development. One third development is we take uh, a third of the product that we develop is features that we think are going to be really, really cool. And a third of the product is bug fixes. And a third of the development for the product is uh, features that people vote on, right? So we let them vote on different features that they would like. And we take those top features and we include all of those three aspects into the 
next development cycle, right? So it's a really good way of getting feedback and understanding and getting involved and developing working software. And, and that it's really worked out to be quite beneficial for us. But the great thing about it is, is it gives us an opportunity to fail and fail fast, right? So I, don't, I just love this photo. I, I always have to put this in my presentation somewhere. I don't care where it is. But the important thing is you need to do tests, right? You need to do unit tests or you need to have some type of test-driven development. So you're always understanding what's happening within your, your product. And so we use a tool and uh, it's uh, based around continuous integration and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. But the idea is that as soon as you develop a line of code, you can implement it into the product. It runs a test to see if that is actually gonna break the build or not. If it breaks the build, it returns a line that says, uh-oh, you broke the build, and this would be red. And it says, this is exactly what needs to be fixed. And you need to go in there and fix that line of code immediately. Or you say, or it integrates it and says, ah, oh, perfect, it's green, you move forward, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that. But the idea is that it gives you an opportunity to fail fast, and you don't want to get into yourself into a situation where you're developing uh, software or releasing software after a long period of specifications in a long time and then find out that somewhere a line of code was not good. By doing continuous integration, you continually understand what is working and what is not working. We also do a lot of pair programming. Uh, pair programming is really beneficial for us because it helps uh, avoid silos, right? It helps spread the workload across multiple teams. And so what happens is you have this collective code ownership and you have everybody who obviously has a, a basic level of understanding that can change the code, right? And this, is, I know it sounds a little dangerous to do this, but what it does is it avoids bottlenecks and it creates a team atmosphere that everybody takes pride and ownership in the developing of that particular product, not just certain lines of code within that, line of, within that product. So it, it really creates this team atmosphere and avoids any bottlenecks. So if something were to ever happen, it gives you an opportunity for you, everyone to understand how to fix that. And with that, uh, I have some useful links for you. Uh, that's how Atlassian does uh, development around Confluence, um, specifically Confluence, but also around uh, Atlassian's business practices. I, I sort of shared with you a little bit about the starter licenses. You know, we look at that in several different ways. We really try to make sure that uh, we're constantly delivering the best possible software that we can. We're constantly releasing it out in the wild. We're getting lots of feedback on that. We're understanding what's happening. We're failing early and we're failing fail often, right? But at least we can correct those mistakes as soon as we have them, and it helps us understand how we can be uh, more uh, more beneficial in the software that we develop and, and deliver. So there's some useful links, and then just one last uh, slide about Atlassian. We're always hiring. So we're a Sydney-based company. If uh, you uh, are interested in learning about more about Atlassian, you go to Atlassian.com. If you're interested in any positions that you see there, you can always go to talent at and uh, send them your CV. But we're always looking for great people. So if there's any great people in this room that are looking for uh, a move to Sydney, Australia, um, you know, this is a great opportunity for you. So with that, thank you very much.